Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. My guest today is Lydie Klotz. His new book is Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less. Lydie Klotz is the Copenhaver Associate Professor at the University of Virginia, where he is appointed in the schools of engineering, architecture, and business. He co-founded and co-directs the university's Convergent Behavioral Science Initiative, which engages and supports applied interdisciplinary research. Klotz earned a highly selective career award from the National Science Foundation, one of the NSF's first awards through its INSPIRE program, and over $7 million in competitive research funding. He advises influential decision makers that straddle academia and practice, working with the Departments of Energy and Homeland Security, the National Institutes of Health, Resources for the Future, Ideas 42, and Nature Sustainability. A columnist for the behavioral scientist, Klotz has written for venues such as Science, Nature, Fast Company, and The Daily Climate. Okay, we uh, talk about many things in this conversation, including soccer and cycling, of course. Uh, but in the context of uh, you know, how rules get added and subtracted, uh, we talk about his uh, experimental research on the human propensity to only add to solve problems, and that subtracting things to solve a problem it doesn't come as first nature. It's kind of a second nature thing you got to remind yourself to do. Uh, then we move to the evolutionary origins of this, why humans would have evolved this cognitive heuristic of adding rather than subtracting, related to the loss aversion, the endowment effect, the sunk cost fallacy, and so on. Talk about the history of civilization as constantly adding, but at some point it can be more effective if things are subtracting. For example, the regulatory state has become so massively complex, no one really understands it. Then we talk about specific examples from his book, like the Vietnam War Memorial as an example of subtraction that still carries the power of some of these complex, massive monumental architecture designs around the world. Then we talk about the Embarcadero Freeway and how that was removed and what that did for the city of San Francisco. Uh, talk about Feynman diagrams and uh, Ed Edward Tufte's uh, research on simplifying and effectively presenting the visual display of information and data that's so complex the mind, visual, visual cortex just can't process it. It has to be simplified, and, and what are some of the tricks of the trade there? And then we wrap up talking about solving climate change, racism, gender issues, and things like that by subtracting rather than adding. And as you'll hear, there's no simple solutions. These are complex problems. But adding to your repertoire, the idea of subtracting is actually a good strategy. So with that, thanks for listening, and thank you for your support. As always, if you appreciate the podcast, it is primarily supported through the Skeptic Society, my day job that I had. And if you want to support it, go to skeptic.com slash donate. Give us 10 bucks, 100 bucks, $10,000, whatever. Uh, whatever you can afford to support it, that's what uh, continues the podcast, along with the magazine and all our media uh, work and so forth. So thanks for listening coming on the show. The new book is Subtract, uh, The Untapped Science of Less. So I will have already given you a proper introduction here, but why don't you just kind of um, give us a, a brief biography, how one comes to uh, study the science of less. What's the story there? A little bit of background about yourself, too. Yeah, I mean, so I'm a engineer by training. I'll kind of work backwards. Um, uh, and have always, you know, came to behavioral science uh, by way of sustainability, basically. So I was always interested in engineering and how we create a, a more sustainable world, um, specifically trying to address climate change. And, you know, uh, there's certainly a lot of terrific technologies out there, um, and we need to keep advancing those technologies uh, on the engineering side. But also a lot of these things already exist like we know how to create a net zero energy home we and so a lot of the gap between what's possible in terms of sustainability in the built environment and what's actually happening seem to be in the the behavioral science and the thing that's kind of unique that i do is i look at the behavioral science of the designers the decisions that the designers are making because you know one thing 
as engineers, as a community of designers, when we think about, oh, people are irrational or people don't always make decisions in predictable ways, we're like people <laughs> and that's the, the users. Um, and I'm, I'm more interested in the designers and what, how we might not make decisions in, in rational ways. So um, I, I've you know, studied this a lot uh, in different ways, um, you know, looking at nudging, for example, how can we apply nudging to built environment decisions? But the subtraction is the, you know, my favorite research that I've ever been involved in, and I think probably the most important, um, so time will tell on that, but um, it is kind of getting at this basic arguably the most basic design decision, which is when we try to change something from how it is to how we want it to be, what what do we think of first? And we think of adding first is what our research shows. And um and that obviously, you know, has implications for for sustainability, right? I mean if we talk about just at the grandest level, we're exceeding planetary boundaries, um, then uh if we only add to try to solve those problems, we're not gonna uh, we're not gonna be able to to do what we want to do. So yeah, that's a little bit about my academic background. I also played uh, professional soccer for a couple of years, and you uh, did. So Where? I know you're a competitive cyclist. Uh, Pittsburgh Riverhounds. So I was in like the second division, uh, one oh, wow. below Major League Soccer. But we we played the Major League Soccer teams, and I mean that was my you know although I never really thought about what I wanted to do with my life until I was done playing soccer and obviously <laughs> I didn't play well enough to to, <laughs> to not have a second act but that's you know that's been a really a really great thing for me yeah when I was came up uh, it was just baseball basically football baseball football basketball and soccer re wasn't really introduced in America in, in any big way until like my daughter in the early in the 90s and then AYSO and all that was was pretty big so I became our assistant soccer coach because I, I just couldn't get the rules fast enough to, and I didn't know how to coach him. And I still don't get this offside thing. Like, you know, why, anyway. That's I was just, just going to say offsides, yeah. I, I was going to say just, <laughs> and the offside rules, and then the scores would be like 12 to 11. You know, it'd be much more interesting. But that's, <laughs> see, that would be a good subtraction. Subtract that rule to make soccer more interesting. <laughs> now, my wife is from Germany. Yeah, she well, absolutely uh, thinks this is the worst idea ever because she likes those one nothing <laughs> uh, games or 2-2 two -two and it ends up in a shootout. <laughs> Yeah, she's a purist. Um, I don't. It's an interesting systems problem. If you took away offsides, what would happen? Because I, I actually, um, they're getting into the weeds in soccer here, but there there have been times when they tried not having offsides, and it actually like encourages the teams to put more defenders back and kind of backfires in terms of making the games more lively. But anyway, oh really? Yeah, that's, that's a, interesting. You know, right when your daughters, yeah, right when your daughters were coming up is kind of when I was because that was when the World Cup was in the United States and. You know they were just starting to get a league um so yeah it's been interesting to watch by it the way this is a, a slight sidebar but on the shoot penalty shootouts uh i don't i don't know much about it but i remember somebody did a study on uh, whether it's better for the uh, goalie to just always dive left or right before the shoot and take a 50 50 shot or if it's better yeah. to wait to see which direction you don't happen to know about that do you it's interesting um yeah i uh I know too much about this. We could do the whole pocket. So my first book was sustainability through soccer. Um, and I, like I used <laughs> really? all these soccer. Seriously? Yeah. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. No joke. It was um, 2016. <laughs> and I used all these soccer analogies to kind of, the point was to explain these complex system things uh, through, through soccer analogies. Um, it ended up being only people were interested in it who were interested in sustainability and soccer instead of what I was hoping for, which was like the soccer will get people interested in sustainability. But um, the penalty, <laughs> yeah, the penalty shootout, like it's uh, so what you're describing, if the goalie basically on a penalty kick, the, the goalie's just standing there. And if the goalie doesn't move, the shooter has a huge advantage because they can just pick a corner. And if you make a good shot, there's no way the goalie can save it. They'd have to be superhuman. But the goalies are allowed to move early. So the question would be like, should the goalie move early every time and maybe just go to the same side every time? Um, I think, and one of the challenges with doing those studies in my mind <laughs> is that they kind of project what happened when the, 
So they'll say, for example, oh, look, these balls hit the back of the net in the middle of the goal. So if the goalie hadn't moved, um, they would have saved it. Or this ball missed the goal um, and that didn't, um, this ball missed the goal and therefore it didn't matter what the goalie did. But in fact, the reason the shooter misses the goal is because they're scared of, you know, they're, they're intimidated or worried or thinking about what the goalie's doing. So anyway, as a penalty, I was uh, tried to score goals in soccer um, that definitely the goalie should should move. Don't stand still. But um, OK, but the, right. but the papers that are on that, I think, uh, are kind of are limiting a little bit. And they're always changing that rule too, whether the goalie can move or not. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, my wife's a huge fan of England. So the the recent Euro Cup final mm. against Italy, where <laughs> the shooter, the young guy, he's 19, I think, paused and then the goalie yeah. dove one direction. Then he had an easy shot, but he shanked it off the po- goal post. It's like, oh, my God. You know, that anybody I could have made that yeah. one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, super you think, tense. But you think about all the all the stuff that's going on in that moment, right? You're having to process that the goalie moved, plus you're having to then... I don't know, like translate that down to your foot and get it accurate. So it's a, yeah, it's challenging. I used to just, I, I still think if you just hit a perfect penalty kick, it's really hard for the, the goalie to save it, even if they guess Dive right. in that try direction, to yeah. Get the, yeah. Yeah, interesting. All right, uh, give us a brief description of what the convergent behavioral science initiative is i presume it has something to do with this research you're doing now for this book yeah um i and i guess you know my overall research mission is to kind of bring behavioral science more into design and into, in, into engineering and i think it's something that gets considered but it's um often a an ad hoc thing so or or after the fact so we'll say okay we designed this cockpit now we may need to make sure that it it works for the people in it and the more we're learning about behavioral science the more opportunities there are to kind of design with behavioral science you know um engineering historically has done an amazing job of creatively applying other sciences like physics and and chemistry um and we're what i'd like to see is for engineering to do the same uh or make the same contributions um, to behavioral science uh, and psychology in particular, because that's the one that's, it, in my opinion, advanced the most. Um, and it's not that engineers are the only ones that can do this, but as people like Daniel Kahneman talk about, hey, there's a technology emerging from behavioral science. And it, it's amazing that all these behavioral scientists are thinking about ways to use their science to make the world a better place. Um, but I'd also like engineers to be making our contribution in that area too. So that's what the Convergent Behavioral Science Initiative at the University of Virginia, we bring together, um, you know, engineers, uh, behavioral scientists, and, you know, generally just people who like working together uh, and try to study some of these problems. And, you know, the the research that the book is based on um, about people systematically overlooking subtraction is a, a product of that process. It's me, um, but I'm collaborated with you know, me kind of bringing this question of like, hey, when we design, why do we default to adding or do we default to adding? And then three um, trained behavioral scientists uh, helping out, like working together collectively on that research. And that's what led to the the paper in the book. Yeah, the paper in Nature. I saw that. that I read that. It was pretty impressive. Um, so just, just briefly, you mentioned Nudge for our listeners that are not familiar with that. This is Cass Sunstein and Dick Thaler's idea of a choice architecture where um, people are, are, are presented with options uh, and one choice architecture design is better than another one if you want to nudge them in a certain direction. So, for example, in California, uh, we have an opt-in program for organ donation. So I have to punch the little dot on my driver's license that says I will give my organs if I die in a car accident. Whereas I think Oregon, north of us, has an opt out where you are giving your organs (laughs) to uh, donation if you uh, die in a car accident, unless you opt out by punching the thing. So they have much higher rates of organ donation than California. And that would be an example of, but, but so here's a question, who decides what's the better thing? Well, I guess socially we decide it's good for, if you're already dead, you should give up your organs. That's a good thing for society. So we nudge people in that direction or these menu designs, right? You, You have to design a menu somehow. 
So, you know, why not put the low, low calorie and healthier foods up front? Cause that's the first thing people turn to or whatever, and put the desserts and the alcoholic drinks at the back, something like that. Yeah, I've, I had the great fortune to work with Elke Weber and Eric Johnson. And Eric Johnson, he's, he's the one who wrote the organ donation paper. You should have him on your show. He's, coming, he's got a book coming out called The Elements of Choice in October. And he's just one of these amazing guys. He's been doing work alongside Kahneman and Thaler and these people all through time. And um, anyway, so, so their answer to your question about who decides is a really good one. And, and or for me, this argument that there's no such thing as a, nu- a neutral choice architecture, right? Um, so the you're either designing the organ donation thing to be in what you think is the best interest of society, or you're just throwing your hands up in the air and saying, this is, this is what we've done. So I think that the situation when it wasn't, when donating your organs wasn't the default, um, that was that wasn't somebody sitting there thinking, oh, we shouldn't make this the default. It was just somebody not understanding the power of defaults. Um, And so I think for cases like that, um, it's like we need to be considering the the choice architecture. The other thing, the great thing that Eric says about this is that people have been doing this for forever. They're called marketers. (laughs) And so (laughs) if we're not, you know, if we're not considering choice architecture, and you know asking these hard questions about what's in the best interest of society then we're um we're leaving it up to people who are going to do what's in the best interest of their company company is right yeah that's right uh you know i was thinking about this with um uh, vaccine hesitancy you know now we're seeing companies yeah. offering you know a hundred dollars to get the vaccine or whatever i can imagine the employees that already got it going hey where's my hundred bucks <laughs> you know but just somehow uh, something's short of a a government uh, fiat law, you know, requiring vaccines, which which would get a lot of pushback on the right, particularly, uh, you know, you, you have to design some kind of system to nudge people in that direction. But your sense of, of, of how to kind of address this vaccine hesitancy problem when I was a kid, there, there was no like polio vaccine. Oh, I want my freedom. I don't want that polio vaccine or, you know, just nobody kind of went down that path. And now we, we do have that. Yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. I mean, I know they're, they're trying this thing in Philadelphia. Um, the University of Pennsylvania has this behavior change for good where they're trying these, um, uh, it's basically, a, I guess, a negative lottery. That's not the technical term. But what happens is if you, if you they have a prize, and they off, they're going to give the prize to somebody. It's like Publishers Clearinghouse. They're going to come to your house with a big check. But if you haven't gotten the vaccine, you don't get the prize. <laughs> and um, so they're seeing if that will, I mean, it's based on behavioral science principles. I, I have no idea if that'll work in, in this case. I, I mean, the money one makes a lot of sense. We're, we're on vacation now with my uh, friend who works in a mining company, and they're giving $200 to each of their employees who do it. And he said 70, you know, his estimate was 75% of the people are, are, have done it because of that incentive, not because of um, anything else. So, I mean, but that's a pure, that's a pretty basic economic incentive. It's just, it's just nuts that this uh, somehow got conflated with, with freedom, but anyway. Well, it does, is in, in a way, it's a stand in it, kind of a proxy truth, I call them, that you know, even if you don't know anything about vaccines or climate change or whatever, you know, you're, you're kind of signaling publicly, I'm against it or I'm for it, is really a proxy for something else. I trust science and large institutions like this to be mostly reliable. Therefore, I'll get the vaccine or I'll, I'll a- a- agree that climate change is real, even if I don't know much about it. You know, some of the research shows that people that are uh, skeptical of climate change and people that accept the science, uh, they don't, neither one of them knows any more about climate science. Who knows much about it at all? It's a technical science. I, you know, I can't read these papers. I don't understand them. And, uh, and, and so it's, a, it's a kind of a way of saying, you know, I, I, I trust the science or I trust the institutions or I don't. I don't trust big government or I don't trust big pharma. You know, the vaccine hesitancy has some of that uh, going back to the, you know, autism vaccine thing with, you know, like, and that was sort of an equal opportunity left and right. You know, I let liberals say, I don't trust big corporations making money off of these medical products or on the right, I don't trust big government telling me what I can do. You know, so I, I think there's an element of that in there too. 
Anyway, I'm kind of sidetracked there. Let's get back to your experimental evidence. You present this, those watching this little uh, Lego figure here in the book. For those listening, it's uh, a bunch of Lego blocks with a little stormtrooper from Star Wars. And, uh, and you have to solve some kind of problem where you can put a brick on top of the thing without it collapsing. And you have to do something. So walk us through what is it people typically do and or what's the problem to be solved and, and, and what's the real solution? Yeah. Um, well, I'll start. I've got another demonstration too. So this oh, okay, is the, oh, perfect. the beginning, yeah. and this this really clearly shows the the thought process. But then I'll get to the Lego thing because, and I'm glad we get to talk about the Star Wars one because the bridge I'm about to describe wasn't actually one of our experiments, but people are thinking that it is because it's such a sticky story. Anyway, so I was playing Legos with my son who was three at the time, and we were building this bridge. It wasn't level. I turned around behind me to grab a block to add to the shorter column. And by the time I had turned around, he had removed a block from the longer column. <laughs> and uh, so right there in front of me, this was this thing that I'd been thinking about for a long time. It was that whole diatribe I offered you at the beginning about like, oh, sustainability and decision making. What's at the core of this? What's the mindset that keeps us from being unsustainable? But I'd never been able to boil it down into something that I could actually like uh, hold in my hand literally, but also describe the concept well enough. And so... Um, I began carrying the bridge around with me and, and testing it on my graduate students and everybody was adding the same way that, that I did. And then I took it to Gabe Adams, who's one of these collaborators in the Convergent Behavioral Science Initiative and a friend and somebody who I'd been talking about, you know, sustainable decision making with and what I thought was basically this idea that was demonstrated in the bridge. And she said to me, she says, oh, so what you're interested in is why don't we subtract to make things better? And um, that to make things better was a, a really key part of this uh, because it distinguishes it from loss aversion and, and all these reasons that we don't subtract because it it's making things worse. And um, so anyway, from this from this simple Lego bridge, we ended up doing tens of thousands of hours of, of research. And I'll, I'll describe the, the Stormtrooper one in a second because that demonstrates it really well. But the what the research ended up showing, just to skip right to the punchline, was really similar to what happened to me in that moment, which is that when we're thinking about how we change something or how we make something better, whether it's a Lego bridge or whether it's you know your uh, travel itinerary, whether it's random grids on a computer screen, we first think about what we can add, which isn't necessarily a problem, but the problem becomes we think about what we can add. It's an okay solution and we move on and we never even consider subtraction as a way to make things better now we had that evidence for a while and you know when we would present it to smart people uh other psychologists they would say who cares uh that maybe this is just the right way to do it it's only bad if you're missing out on things that are definitely better and like with the bridge example i made a level bridge and my son made a level bridge but the so we designed our, our main experiments to be where subtracting was the only way to get the right answer. And so the, the image that you showed there, we basically constructed a tower out of Legos, a big wide uh, column, and it was supported by one shaky brick. And we asked them to put a building block on top of that and without it falling over. So you had to reinforce the tower in some way um, and the easiest way to do it was to pull away the one brick that was making it unstable and put the put the platform down a level and then it's resting on a perfectly stable column. The harder additive way of doing it was to add eight bricks or add bricks in the corner, but add bricks to make that top layer stable. And we told people to do it in as few of bricks as possible. We told people to take a um, told people that it costs money to to add bricks and people still overlooked the the subtractive option the, the the taking away one block was the faster way and easier way to solve this problem so that was how the the lego bridge got translated to something where it was like this is obviously the wrong answer and it and that was proof that when you're when you're think that people weren't even thinking about subtraction that it wasn't that oh they're thinking about it and then saying oh i just want to keep this it's better to add um so, yeah. Yeah, and I love the story in the book about the uh, bicycle design of, of the, the little push bikes or my son has a cruisy bike. So my daughter's 29 now, so back in the 90s when I was teaching her how to ride a bike, it was just training wheels. 
And, uh, you know, so she would do that until she was getting pretty confident that it was time to take the training wheels off. So I had to run alongside next to her, hold it with my hand underneath the seat. And, you know, of course, I have this great memory of the day she finally mastered it. You know, oh, there we go. And she thought I was still holding and I wasn't holding. And she's like, oh, my God, you're not holding me. And it was very exciting. I loved it. But my son, we got him one of these little push bikes like your son has, but no pedals. And they learned balance. And by the and then we got him a pedal bike. And it was like, I don't know, one minute for him to master it. It was just boom, gone. So there was a nice solution of take take away the training wheels, take off the pedals, and you have a much lighter bike. And it's more efficient and effective for teaching balance. But I forget the name of the guy yeah, who, who and did it's- that. Ryan McFarland is the guy who did Strider bikes, which is like the, the bikes, market yeah, yeah, leader yeah. in this area. But I mean, what's fascinating about that is this is, you know, a hundred years of bike innovation, right? Where you're getting fatter tubes, more training wheels, um, or different training wheels, bigger tires, and, you know, little cabooses that attach to another bike. And nobody thought to take the, the pedals away. When I told my son, I was, you know, having the same experience with you as you were having, Michael, except for with my son who had the balance bike. And I said, you're lucky, man. When I was growing up, we, we didn't have these things. And, uh, and he, so he said, well, didn't you have wrenches? <laughs> and so it's like a really <laughs> yeah. easy solution yeah. in retrospect. Yeah. Yeah, that's really funny. I was looking for the, I had a picture of the original uh, Dressine bike from the 18... 18- 50s or 40s maybe yeah i mean the original designs didn't have pedals at all you just pushed along with your feet uh so yeah. it's interesting that kind of came full cycle uh, there so it came full yeah i i know that was um one comment that people make is like oh well this isn't new but it, i mean it's new in terms of becoming a innovation that people actually use and is on the market so yeah so the uh, the experimental evidence converges to show that we for the most part to solve problems add rather than subtract and that there's some balance there uh, and that, that's not going to fall into one of these replication crisis issues where it fails to replicate. You're pretty confident that this is experimentally true. <laughs> oh man. I mean, the, Ben, the other co-author was, I was ready to publish this thing after like one study and we he ended up doing, we ended up doing like 20. <laughs> so um, I, I think the thing that, yeah, I'm pretty confident that it is going is not going to fail to replicate, you know, what what we did. I think there's there's definitely open questions that we point to in the paper about, you know, what are the boundaries of this? Uh, so, you know, we we did it on the the Lego Stormtrooper, which is kind of a cute example. I think the most convincing experiment we did um, was grids on a computer screen because there is no uh, kind of. No, there you could. There was no prior experience that people would have had with this task, and the way to solve those was to subtract from uh, one corner or add to three corners. Uh, so again, subtracting was the better solution. Again, people overlooked it. Uh, we also did some things that kind of um, align with theory about what would what would if people aren't thinking about this, what would need to change for them to think about it, and so. When we offered reminders, for example, we, we would give people a cue and say, hey, you can add or subtract to solve this thing. And that increased the rates of subtracting. Well, big deal. A reminder is going to increase rates of subtracting. But the reminder didn't increase the rates of adding at all. <laughs> so it's this really striking result where the, the reminder was redundant for adding, but for subtracting, it brought new ideas to mind, which shows that, yeah, people may not have, were, were not thinking about it. And then um, we also had people do repetitions where like for the grids, they might do five, um, five different versions of it or solve it in five different ways. And if they stumbled across subtraction, which is, you know, what happened to my son when we were playing with Legos, if they came across the subtractive option in one of their repetitions, they were more likely to choose it. Um, And then the other thing we did that I think, you know, my psychologist friends found is the most convincing evidence was we put people under cognitive load. So have a, a number line scrolling underneath the the task while they're doing it. And then people have to push an F key every time a five goes by. So they're basically distracted. And the more distracted you are, the more likely you are to like rely on these kind of default tendencies in your, in your brain. And, um, and that also um, moved the needle uh, and made people when people were distracted, they were less likely to subtract. They were more likely to go with this kind of automatic process. So, yeah, I, I mean, our core findings 
I will replicate. Um, but, you know, other paradigms, one question that we had, we called it the, uh, it, we had various names for it, but it's like the sardine and the grilled cheese sandwich, for example. It's like, <laughs> there's certain situations that are just begging, right, you cringed, right? Because disgust is this this feeling that if if something invokes disgust, we're going to think about removing it. So there's undoubtedly situations where this may, wouldn't hold true. Um, and I think, you know, draw, finding those boundaries, also finding cultural boundaries and knowledge boundaries. I mean, the, the cool thing about that, it's cute to have a three-year-old subtracting the Legos, but it, it's a, the only bad thing about that story is that it makes people think that this is like a learned behavior that we always add. And we don't have evi any evidence of that. Um, I think my son is way worse at well, not way worse. He's exactly the same in terms of like defaulting to adding as far as I can tell. So understanding how this has changed based on training, also understanding how it differs across cultures, I think are are things that, you know, this isn't not replicating, but there's certainly things to still to figure out about this. And then the, the last thing I'll say there is we didn't find that people can't do it right we just found that it's the first idea that comes to mind and so i you know certainly people can subtract when they when they think of it i mean if you if you gave instructions uh after presenting the problem you can either add bricks or take bricks away surely they would be more likely to then think of that so it's what you're talking about is almost like a cognitive heuristic that Tversky and kahneman always talked about a rule of thumb a kind of a default quick you know thinking fast and slow fast thinking but if you tell people it's okay to reason your way through it and think about it and here's some tips well then people actually reason pretty well exactly yeah and um we did one interesting thing there that we didn't find evidence of those like a reminder to that you could add or subtract on the grids didn't necessarily carry over to other problems so as you're giving yourself these reminders that you can add or subtract. You kind of have to think about how you putting them in place close to the moment of the decision, right? So if, if by listening to this podcast, you're convinced that you will always remember to think of subtraction across every context, then, then great. Um, other, you know, for us mortals, I, you know, I remind myself when I'm making my to-do list that I also should consider stop doings as, as a way <laughs> to, to improve to don't my list. schedule for the next <laughs> Right. Yeah, to don't <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, as a larger subject, I bring this up a lot on this podcast, is uh, this problem of to what extent humans are naturally irrational, unreasonable. We always fall for these cognitive biases and heuristics uh, and that T Tversky and Kahneman made famous, but Gert Dingerinzer and some evolutionary psychologists like Tubi and Cosmides here at U UC Santa Barbara uh, pushed back saying, actually, if you present the problem in a different way, you know, like an ecologically natural environment or a way to think about solving a problem, people are pretty good at that. And, you know, just give them a few cues like, you know, the famous Wasson test where you, you have two cards turned over two cards turned down you have some rule like if it's a three if it's an odd number then there's a you know a d underneath the three or whatever and you have to flip i forget the exact <laughs> configuration but you have to flip card it's kind of a logic problem but two being cosmetes and gergerins are point out well if you present it like an, in a natural ecological environment you're a bartender you have four people sitting there drinking which ones should you card uh, to see if they're over 21. Well, if the person's drinking Coca-Cola, you don't need to do that uh, and, or, or whatever. But people are better at that because it's kind of a, a natural environment. So I'm, I'm thinking probably if you present these puzzles in which it becomes clear subtraction is a, a viable option, people would be better at it. Yeah, we do have some evidence from natural environments and of course what you sacrifice when you go study a natural environment is the careful control but yes, we, uh, yeah 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 our our university um as all universities do it seems like ha when a new president came in they had a strategic planning activity and everybody offered you know all the university stakeholders so students faculty alumni donors community members offered their ideas to improve the university and we got our hands on that data when this is actually reported in the paper and like 80 or it was, it was even bigger than the the experiments it's like 90 percent of the ideas were things to add to the university so it was like add a you know mental health 
programs for international students and, uh, you know, lots of good things, obviously, and at an ice hockey arena um, and very few kind of takeaways. Um, so that was one natural example. We have another natural example we have that we report in a different study is uh, we studied the, the words used in patents um, and uh, and you can Obviously, you can do like text analytics to look through all of the Google, the patent data that Google has. And so all the way back to 1976. And then you can look for add and subtract and also like close synonyms to add and subtract. And basically what we found in the patent data was the subtractive terms were used way less than the additive terms. And, you know, it took us a while analyzing that. And then we're like, oh, crap, what if what if that just mimics natural language? Um, then it wouldn't really be a big deal. But in fact, it was even worse than natural language. So additive terms were used way more in patents. And again, you know, the, the hole in that argument in terms of people not thinking of subtracting is that, well, maybe they just know, maybe there's something about the patent process that makes it better to, um, better to use additive terms. It makes you more likely to get a patent if you can say you, you put something new on there. So, but you know, we do have some evidence from natural environments, but I do agree that that's a, that's, you know, the engineers that I say explain this to, I mean, that was a lot of Gigerenzer's stuff, right? Is like, well, people with expertise don't do this and that's what matters. Um, and uh, the engineers I think would, oh, there's a lot of engineers who would argue, well, I don't, I don't overlook this as an option. And that's, you know, we haven't, we don't have evidence on that one way or the other. Right. If there was a replication crisis in engineering, we'd know about it because bridges would collapse or planes would fall out of the sky. <laughs> right. It is, I don't know. I want to, I mean, the replication crisis, I think it's great for like improving psychology. Um, but I also think, I mean, there is kind of a replication crisis in engineering, right? But it's like, that's what engineering's for. I mean, think about like, it's Newton in the app, you know, way more about the history of science. So just correct me uh, if I'm screwing this up. But I, like a really simple example is like, okay, here's gravity. This is how fast things fall because of gravity. And yeah, that's like this universal principle, but there's, there's modifiers on it. If a feather is flying with air friction back and forth, it's not going down at the exact same rate as a bowling ball. And that doesn't mean that gravity's wrong. It just means that like we've learned more since then. So I think there, I mean, there's certainly the things in the replication crisis, like a lot of the priming studies is just like, oh, this just isn't true. But I think there's other things where it's like, okay, loss aversion, people are criticizing loss aversion because there's, there's boundaries around it. It's like, well, big deal. That's what that's what science is about. You find a principle and then you like find out what's wrong with it and try to fine tune it. And, um, you know, engineering, when we have equations that are, you know, have all these variables in them, all those variables basically represent places where something hasn't replicated and you've had to find out what, why it isn't replicating and then account for that thing. So, um, anyway, so I wouldn't say that engineers are, uh, any better. Um, well, Anyway, yeah, you're right about the bridges falling down thing. There's very physical evidence if your science isn't right. But, um, but I do think that um, I, w I don't like to be super hard on, on psychologists just because they're, you know, the, the well-done studies don't, don't replicate. Yeah. yeah, so since you mentioned uh, loss aversion, losses hurt twice as much as gains feel good. Uh, and related to that, the endowment effect, you know, if you own something, you value it roughly twice as much as an object that you don't own and, and so forth. This is the basis of why we tend to add rather than subtract, right? We just want to have stuff in our nature. So let's talk about the evolutionary I, I origins of this problem. Yeah, we can talk about the evolutionary origins. Um, I think, I mean, there's, there's two things here. Like one is not even thinking about subtracting as an option. And that's what our research found. Um, and that I think is before, or not, not before, but it's different than loss aversion because loss aversion is like, hey, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking I'm gonna, do I wanna clean out my closet and get rid of these two shirts? Uh, and that's emotionally painful. You're thinking about the subtraction. You've thought about this option and that's when it becomes emotionally harmful. So I think, I, you know, the nuances of the, phenomenon are, are less important than the fact that just, hey, there's two stages or two basic stages here. One is to think of something and then one is to actually follow through with it. And that's where the book kind of goes beyond the paper. I mean, the paper is just focused on why we don't think of subtraction and the book's talking about all the reasons we might not actually do it. 
to to your question about evolutionary stuff, I mean, just this desire to acquire, right, has really helped us pass down our genes, whether it's, you know, the easiest example is food. Um, but when I mean, you think about stockpiling food or just eating as much calories as, as you possibly can in, in a short period of time, and that's been an evolutionary helpful behavior, that's a kind of, you can see how that would overlap with our adding behavior in some areas. The other evolutionary one that to me seems really related is just this desire to to show competence, to show that we can interact with our world capably. You know, so this bowerbirds example that I use in the book, um, you know, the, the males build the nests uh, and then the females go around and decide who to mate with based on the, the nests. And but then the female, after they've mated, goes and builds a nest to actually provide shelter. So the whole point of these these nests is just to display that the person that the, the bird that built them is is competent can interact effectively with the world and i mean you can see a lot of parallels to some of the ways that we add nowadays right right so uh if, if you think about life in the evolutionary environment the paleolithic no one had much of anything so adding something is kind of good it's got to be good <laughs> right so i mean i talk about this you know the income inequality didn't exist because there was no income <laughs> and uh, so if you don't have much <laughs> so if you don't add much stuff so here what you're talking about like subtracting things take taking away you you can't be too close to the left wall of uh, ultimate simplicity like you know larry page and and, and sergey brin in their garage building a, a search engine called google well, they can't just go, well, let's just subtract employees. We got to add employees. We got to add stuff. So maybe, you know, 10 years later, someone like you would come in and go, and maybe they bring in someone like you that our company is bleeding too much payroll. What can we get rid of? So here you have to be far away from the left wall of simplicity, kind of in the middle of the bell curve where you've added all this stuff. Or just think about government agencies. You know, we well, we added this this Every, government agency yeah. back in the 30s, and we still have it. We needed it back then because it was the depression and the farmers were going out of business, so we got to give farmers subsidies, so we have to have this department that does that and all these employees. But once you set that up, it's really hard to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's such a, I thought that's where you're gonna go with the Gigerenzer and when you're talking about the heuristics and, you know, oftentimes that these, uh, what Kahneman and Tversky would argue that the reason these biases have evolved has been helpful over time, right? And so in a world where we don't have anything, like a default to adding is a, a helpful behavior. Um, and so maybe that could be one reason why, why we've evolved that behavior. The other thing that kind of feeds back into that is um, we're surrounded by a physical, when we're we get reminders from our physical world right and so when we're walking around seeing i'm looking out my window at all these houses that have been built and roads and stuff and that's a remind that's a example of how somebody has decided to approve improve this piece of land whereas if somebody subtracted something the the reminder's not sitting there so yes i think uh both through the lens of long history and then through the lens of like what we're reminded of around us there are a lot of reasons to um why this why this uh kind of decision making shortcut may have evolved and why adding just simply was better or is better um i'm not saying i'm pretty agnostic on i don't know i don't know if the split's 50 50 i just know that we're overlooking some portion of our subtractions it doesn't mean we should stop adding yeah right exactly well here i'm reminded of a debate uh that was going on in the 90s on evolutionary theory to what extent evolution has kind of a directionality to it uh, things get go yeah. from simple to complex and so on. And Steve Gould always made this point uh, in his book, Full House, that there has to be a left wall of simplicity and there's no only one way to go. You have to become more complex. Uh, mm -hmm. But at some point away from the far uh, left wall of simplicity, uh, there's no advantage necessarily to be gained by adding more stuff. So as he always pointed out, you know, simple organisms do quite well. Uh, and we exalt yeah. ourselves because we're so complex. We have these massive brains and all these parts and stuff. But actually, you know, single cell bacteria, they're doing just fine. <laughs> or, you know, super yeah. simple sea creatures, you know, that have few moving parts. They're they're not like less evolved. They're they're perfectly evolved for doing exactly what they do. Uh, so we have that. He called he, Gould always talked about this bias we have in Western science that we, we think of, you know, complex is better. Well, no, not necessarily. 
and I, I think the 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 subtracting angle on that too is that the more complex things become the more opportunities there are to subtract i mean going back to your government example which is just such a such an easy one right you add these you know a society has to exist to begin adding laws and rules and regulations and stuff and then the more that get added the more opportunity there is to to make things better by taking some of them away um so so yeah these um it's not that subtracting is the answer but it does seem like the more we add and especially the more we over add the more opportunity there is to, the, the more untapped potential there is in in taking things away well i mean dawkins always write, wrote a beautiful essay on the blind cave fish you know what where does its eyes go well what uh, well uh, you know, as a as a thrust to creationists you know why would god design this fish with no, with no eyes i mean it's just these little spots there and and, uh, you know, you know, so it, but it's an argument or why you'd lose a tail, for example. Well, eyes and tails are expensive to run and it takes energy. And if you have complex eyes that take a lot of energy and you're in an environment that's completely dark and you never need them, then why spend the energy? So natural selection just removes them essentially just by not reproducing them uh, over or a long period of time. That's a nice example of, I think, of that, uh, you know, root subtraction or, or removing stuff. Uh, but since you talked about yeah, I mean yeah, evolution. The, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say. Well, I was just going to say history. evolution is an am okay, sorry. Evolution is an sorry. amazing metaphor for how how we can add and subtract to make things better, right? So adaptations or additions, and then selections or subtractions. You mentioned the fish. I mean, humans. We have a smaller brain than Neanderthals for the same reason, and it's like these parts that we weren't using have been been removed, um, and. The, the results are better for us. So anyway, yeah, yeah, good yeah. example. I should have used the <laughs> yeah. fish in the book. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, you could do that in the second edition or your next book. I always save stuff for future books when I'm trying to trim. By the way, I, I, I your book is like the perfect length. So I, there must have been some decision about what to cut out there. And I love the uh, the little description, the the flap description of the book, which is cut way down. Here, I'll just read it because it's really funny. So they, 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 it's all mostly edited out. Now it just reads, we don't subtract. Why? Our minds add before taking away and biological, cultural, and economic forces push us toward more. But we have a choice. We can do better. Subtract will change not just your day-to-day -day life, but our collective legacy, more or less. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> uh, the more yeah, or less, so. I have to give the more or less I have to give credit to the editor on that one. Um, and, but that, yeah, it's, um, it's daunting to write a book about subtraction and be thinking about like, well, of course I'm leaving some stuff in here that I'm sure somebody else is going to think is unnecessary. We did delete a lot of stuff. There's like 40,000 words that are saved on my computer that I'm sure I'm never going to use for anything, but it made me feel better to, to save them. <laughs> my trick on that is, is to, uh, I have a file that I move stuff into and it's just like my next book file. So I don't feel the loss of yeah. version. Like, oh my God, I spent three days exactly. writing this chapter and now I can't use it. I'll use it in the future. Oh, okay. That feels all right then. <laughs> um, do you ever yeah, use it? You, uh, sometimes, yeah. No, sometimes I do. Yeah, because I, yeah. I write a lot. So it, it doesn't always go to waste. Um, but so uh, what's the thing? Oh, yeah. So starting the, you know, to build a civilization, you talked about Gobekli Tepe, one of my favorite subjects. Uh, and of course, at the left wall of simplicity of civilization, the moment you go from these tiny little bands and tribes to larger chiefdoms and states and empires, it can only get more complex. So again, where your principles come in of removing stuff, uh, has to be away from that where you have just maybe too many laws, but you need some laws, uh, right? So, so you start, you know, adding stuff there. So, to, how'd you get interested in Gobekli Tepe, and what's that an example of there? Well, that was, you know, the furthest. That was one of the really fun things about writing a book is that it forces you to explore things that you never yeah. oh, would I know. otherwise. Yeah. And you know, me as a academic, me looking into the his the origins of civilization and what was going on there from like even from a built environment perspective would be totally out of scope of what I was normally doing but because I was writing this book and you know people would I was curious okay what are the evolutionary roots and then what are some of the the cultural roots or potential roots of this behavior that's how I got interested in it um and I'm a you know a civil engineer by training I think I probably came to that because I like 
big structures at, at some level. Whenever I go, when I went to Rome, I was really interested mm. in the Colosseum. My wife was totally. bored by it. Um, it's awesome. When I, yeah. when I go to, yeah, it's amazing. And, and um, one of the things that I was really surprised to find in looking at the history of civilization, I, I knew that, you know, kind of writing had to be there, social structures, um, even cities as, okay, these are necessary components for scholars to consider this a, a civilization. But there is also this thing they called monumental architecture, <laughs> and it's things like about, about uh, Potbelly Hill in Turkey, um, and uh, which are basically the equivalent of bowerbirds' nests. I mean, they're these things that there's they just exceed any practical function. So it's like the pyramids of Egypt or some of these you know temples and in, uh, in the on the Yucatan. Um, the, all these these monuments, even the Washington Monument, I argue, is could be an example of monumental architecture. So, so the yeah, theory for being sure. that for the for the bands to come together, um, one the they didn't necessarily come together and then start to thrive and then say, okay, we're going to build this massive thing. They building the massive thing could also be what brought them together in the first place. It's like, okay, we're roaming around as bands of 25. We want to have this big structure for whatever religious or, you know, ceremonial purposes. And now to have this big structure, we need to stay in the same spot for a while. We need to work together. We need to be able to communicate with each other. Um, and building that big structure, like building the body of civilization is what built the the mind of civilization. And it's a, it's a theory that has gained you know, I think it's probably the dominant theory in that field now. And um, so how, what does that mean for adding and subtracting? In this very physical sense of adding, right, this was there at the beginning of all civilizations, or at least the civilizations that have turned into into us. Um, and so this, this desire to build things has been there at the genesis uh, of civilization. And that is like a kind of a cultural adding um, a, a cultural force that might help explain our, our modern adding behavior. For those not familiar with Gobekli Tepe, the reason it's so uh, unusual and interesting is its age. It's 11,000 years old, thousands and thousands of years older than the pyramid and, and the Sphinx and all that. And, and the, the original theory was, well, you need uh, agriculture to support a massive population to build these massive monumental architectural feats. And Gobekli Tepe was built at the time when we supposedly were just hunter-gatherers, just barely kind of shifting toward agriculture, so populations couldn't have been large. So how did they do it? Right, so this is the, then my other day job, but skeptic, this is where the ancient astronauts come in, the aliens built them, or there was a super advanced uh, uh, civilization that was around 30,000 years ago, you know, tens of thousands of years older than we think. This is Graham Hancock's theory. And they built it. You know, they had some kind of special technique and wisdom that they passed down to these hunter-gatherers to help them do this, something like that. To me, it's just like, well, we just underestimated the power of hunter-gatherers. They're just smarter and more uh, effective at doing things than we thought they were. Uh, anyway, so, but I thought that was such a good example because uh, I do think, re I agree with your analysis in the book that monumental architecture does bring something emotionally, socially to a group of people. Uh, again, uh, my wife's from Cologne, Germany. So the dome there, the, the cathedral, it's unbelievable. So we go there every year, even though we're, we're atheists, because it's, it's really quite moving, even to someone like me, that's, you know, I don't believe in God at all. And I'm not into religion, but you know, I'm moved. You can't help but be moved. And then I put myself back in, in, in the minds of someone who lived 500 years ago. And when it was just all just, you know, these crappy little mud huts, it's right. like, they must've walked in there and went, holy crap literally holy <laughs> you know this is the power of god yeah. the, the spirit you know religion and and uh so there is a purpose to it even though it doesn't seem very practical uh that i think maybe unites right. people or brings them together or makes them feel awe and wonder you know the importance of uh, of meaning and purpose in life it kind of generates that so I, I think there is a purpose to that kind of monumental architecture on some other level yeah definitely yeah, I was referring to the the physical, like to to move a stone as big as a giraffe, you need to have more than twenty five people. But you're exactly right that the main reason is the the main coming together part is this awe inspiring nature of this monumental architecture. 
Yeah. So again, the problem with civilizations is you have to add rules and you keep adding rules and rules and rules. And at some point it's just, you know, like the regulatory state, it's hard to na navigate. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. So, uh, you know, uh, I was the co-founder of Race Across America, uh, the 3,000 mile transcontinental bike race, 1982, just four of us. And the rule sheet was one page. It was just super simple. Like everyone has to take the same route. You have to have a sport vehicle with you and uh, no drafting and, you know, no hanging onto the vehicle, you know, pretty basic stuff, right? But over the years, the, the rule book just got longer and longer and longer because little things would come up. Uh, right. So like no drafting. OK, but let's say you're riding along and there's a crosswind coming and the van pulls up next to you and now it's blocking the wind. So you're getting kind of a draft, but you can't see it because it's on the side because you can't see the wind on the side draft. And then so the, the cyclist is like talking to the support crew or a long water bottle handoff or something like that. Right. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> so then we had to write rules about like how many times the vehicle could come up to feed the cyclists and how long they can stay there because of course the athletes are trying to get any advantage they can right <laughs> and uh, yeah. so then that you know that's like a whole page of rules and then like well you have to have your vehicle behind you at night 24 7 no leapfrogging like they do during the day well what when does nighttime begin all right so we got rules about you know different time zones and we calculate that and then <laughs> just some other funny stories like you know when going th going across the wet this is when i was a race director um you know super hot it was like 110 degrees in arizona so one of the riders gets to uh, Prescott at the top of this mountain in Arizona, and he's just boiling. So he just gets off his bike and jumps into this swimming pool of this little hotel, right? With his helmet uh -huh. and bike shoes, the whole thing. And the owner comes running out, what the hell is going on here? So he calls the police, right? So the police come and they pull over the next cyclist. He's like, what? I didn't do anything. So then we had to have a rules. Okay, no jumping in swimming pools. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and like peeing on the side of the road, you know. No, you can't. So we had to have a rule about that because people were like, "What these these cyclists? They're just peeing on the side of the road, right?" And so we had to have a rule about that. And then, and then, and then one of the women was complaining that, well, we have to actually stop and go in the motorhome to pee, and the guys can just keep rolling on a slow downhill and pee. You know. So we had to, it was like, okay, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to have more rules about that, right? So at some point, and now the rule. I don't know because I'm not involved in the race anymore. But now it's a, it's a pretty thick rule book. So I think that is an analogy for civilization. I mean, you just you just have to have rules because the people are so diverse and they have different motives. Everybody wants to get a little edge. And so they push and push to push the regulations and rules. So you got to add rules on top of rules. And pretty soon you have this. I don't know what the regulatory uh, uh, volumes are. But now I guess it's virtually unnavigable unless you have super good lawyers and accountants to do that for you. And no one really can 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 do that. Yeah, I the one stat that I use in the book, I think there's set there are between 17 and 20 times as long as they were in 1950. So like the rules are growing even faster than our uh, our stock market, <laughs> for example. Yeah, and I, right. one of these I came across on a, one of these podcast discussions that I did, I learned that British Columbia had this awesome uh policy that they put in place to deal with this where if you brought a new piece a new rule basically you also had to bring two that you suggested taking away so it put the really? onus on the people who were bringing oh. the new rule yeah and it they said that it worked amazingly it turned them around so they like they started their trajectory started going down and then uh at least the, the story i heard anyway was it also they don't have the rule anymore that you have to bring to because it's just people are thinking about it. It's been, it's served as this reminder, like getting back to our experiments that you, hey, you can add and subtract to improve this regulatory environment. It's also, I mean, that's a, for me, it's hard to sometimes conceptualize this really deep history and like, okay, civilization building, but you can, it's a really good example, the regulations, right? From the, the bike race, for example, it's like, of course we could, didn't need to think about subtracting when you were just starting the race. But now that the race has been going for 40 years or so, you know, we can subtracting becomes an option. And the fact that we haven't even thought about it for 40 years means that there's some pretty fruitful subtractions to make there. <laughs> yes. Back to soccer that, you know, I still can't figure out the difference between the red card and the yellow card. And these guys fake and fall down and <laughs> pretend that they're hurt so they get a red card against the other guy. I was like, oh, my God, there must be rules and rules and rules about for the refs. Like, how do you know? <laughs> Well, speaking of um, 
Yeah, speaking of edited parts of my book and and soccer, I mean, one thing that I did that didn't make it into the book was soccer is actually like has a really simple rule book, and I think the some of the enduring popularity of that game is because of that. Uh, the simplicity. And, and yeah, yeah, there are all these nuances that people have to figure out, and you know, there is a lot that is up to the ref to figure out the yellow card and the red card. But compared to American football, for example, I mean, soccer you can watch and basically enjoy the first time. It's like People can't use their hands. There's not really any other rules. Offsides is probably the first confusing one that comes up, and you can't like smash into people. Um, but there's it's pretty simple as far as sports go. All right, let's uh, let's go through some of the examples you provide in the book of of uh, subtracting the Vietnam War Memorial. I love that. I've seen that. It's, I've walked through it. It's it's really moving. It's stunning. Yeah. I, I run on the mall in Washington DC whenever we go there and yeah, here's, just find it here's impossible. Here's the, uh, to... the diagram in the book of, of the, uh, uh, the architect's, uh, what was it? Uh, oh, Maya Lin's yeah, portrayal of her winning design. So simple. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you to Maya Lin for letting us use that in the book because it's a pretty famous design. Um, and she was an undergraduate at Yale when she won the, won the design competition for this. Um, and if, if, if you haven't been, I'll do a brief description. I mean, it's it's on the mall in Washington, D.C., surrounded by all this monumental architecture, right? So things that are awe-inspiring in their largeness. And the, the, the wall, in my opinion, is even more awe-inspiring in its understatedness. So it's, first of all, it's submerged below ground. It's cut into the earth, and it's just two black slabs of, of granite. Um, and so it's you know, the essence of the design is very subtractive. Um, and, and Lynn's even on record is describing her design as subtractive. And because it's, it, because it subtracts, it stands out in this arena of large objects. So I, I use that as an example of like, yes, monumental architecture like serves this need and yes, adding can inspire awe, but because we add so much, so can, <laughs> so can subtracting. I um, mean, she does a really good job of that. The other example that I use there is it's also it's add and subtract. And so um, we often get into this binary thinking of either or. I mean, the most common question or criticism I'll get is like, hey, well, this is here's this thing that you shouldn't take away. And um, but that's because we're thinking, well, if it's one, then it can't be the other. And that's that's a really harmful way to think when we see that adding is our first instinct, right? Because if you rule one out, once you think of the other one, then you're, you're going to miss out on the option you don't think of first. Anyway, Lynn subtracts for the essence of her design, but she also has, she adds in a way that I don't think any of the other memorials do, and that she lists everybody who died, every American who died in the Vietnam War on the wall. Um, and so, you know, this really understated design has incredible depth of information that some of the other memorials don't have um so it's a yeah it's a beautiful example of the power of subtracting in the physical world yeah the the, the fact that every one of the fifty-eight thousand whatever names are on there i mean i guess you could say that's additive uh, but it brings the power to the kind of simple uh design of it because you just start walking down this really gradual slope and it's just like the the number of names just grows exponentially like Wow. I mean, it just kind of captures the power of you know, how many people, what, what it means to say 58,000 people died. I mean, it just kind of rolls off the tongue and compared to battles in World War One or two, it just doesn't seem like that much. Uh, but yet when you're there, it's like, holy crap, this is a lot of dead people. It's just stunning. As opposed to maybe the simplicity of a uh, uh, you know tomb to the unknown soldier. He's you know, like the one in Paris. It's just massive. But there's no sense of like, well, how many are there that died that we don't know about or whatever. Yeah. It also, she, that's a really good point about, you know, if, if there was all this ornate stuff around the names, then the names would definitely not stick out as much. But, and, and, and when you look at, I copy and pasted her design description in the book and she devotes a whole bunch of the design description to exactly how these names are going to be inscribed. Um, the other thing she does that's really neat with the names is you would think the default, I guess, would be to list these things alphabetically, lift all, list all the names alphabetically, but she does it chronologically, which 
provides even more information about the the scope of the war but it also i mean it, it forces you to engage more with the monument if you want to find a specific name yes it's in, uh, deeply moving okay i'm looking for uh, another example here from uh, tufty yeah here it is so you talk about Ed, edward yeah. tufty i know i know edward and he, he's just one of my heroes so one of the first uh, diagrams i ever came across of tufty is this map for those watching it's this uh, uh, a map of Napoleon entering Russia when he invaded Russia all the way to Moscow and then back. So there's this big, thick brown line that represents the number of troops, like a million or something, 900,000 or whatever. And then the little black line down here, this thin, tiny little line is those that were left as they, uh, uh, you know, escaped from Russia and, and, you know, total death toll, I forget what it was, but, you know, it was, you know, like, I don't know, seven, eight hundred thousand dead. And this was, you know, two and a half centuries ago. So, I mean, this is popul world population is much smaller. That's just a massive amount of people. So, tough to use that as an example of how much content you can put in a single design to capture emotionally the power of... He, he described it as an anti-war, one of the first anti-war pieces of art, even though it's a, you know, kind of a technical diagram, because it, it conveys, like, the Vietnam War Memorial, which he also pictures here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In his book, here is that image of you know just packing the names in there for those of you watching can see that uh, to capture that. And uh, so I love that you brought up Tufty because uh, you know he's the master at this. And his books, I'm just show them to people, are just these beautiful books. I don't think any publisher would publish these; they'd be so expensive. You know, he kind of had to underwrite it himself. He's got these pull out, fold out, four color throughout, just stunning, stunning. <laughs> Yeah, he took out a second mortgage on his, or maybe second or third mortgage on his house to be able to publish these books because he was so convinced, rightfully so, <laughs> that this needed to get out into the world. And it's proven to be a good uh, economic decision for him. Um, and the, the one of the rules that I use that I always, you know, use in my personal, you know, designing, but also in in the book is and one of Tufty's most famous pieces of advice is to maximize the the data or the ink to information ratio basically so um, and what he does there we talked about loss aversion before um, and one harmful thing with loss aversion and subtracting is that if you if you think of taking something away if you think of this in in negative terms it's going to feel like harder to subtract but Tufty helps people subtract ink by saying maximize this ratio right so he focuses on the thing that you're actually maximizing and i don't i doubt he did that intentionally like knowing about loss aversion but i mean i think that that thinking about what you're actually gaining by taking away is going to make you more likely to do it plus it's just a beautiful thing to remember for all of your uh information design yeah so he he also has a a whole section here in this book on Feynman diagrams which are a nice example of converting complex physical physics mathematics equations into something visual because we're visual primate species we have this massive visual cortex in the back these super complex eyes and retinas and so on and uh you know it's just when you show somebody a chart of numbers it's like i don't even know what i'm looking at uh but if you have a simple curve i mean this this example of changing people's minds like with climate change the, the best thing to convince somebody is just show them the you know the simple super simple graph you know co2 gas is going up and the te earth's temperature going up and this has never happened at this rate and so on oh okay i get it visually as opposed to just these, you know tables and graphs of numbers and anyway so uh, uh after i met um tufty i wanted to bring him to my uh lecture series i was hosting at caltech but you know he was now making a lot of money i don't know if you've ever been to one of his uh is his events but it's a show i mean i went to the one in la there was i don't know like a thousand people there and they paid a lot of money and he has all these books from history i mean he's got like first editions of galileo's original books and he has these puts these white gloves on and he brings them around and shows them to every person in the audience just really incredible just a great so i wanted to bring him to caltech but i couldn't afford him and i said so what can i do he goes I, if you can find Feynman's van i want to see it so <laughs> Now, Richard Feynman, the Feynman diagrams, he famously had this 1976 Dodge cargo van, 
big ugly van that people drove in the 70s. And he had, uh, I guess, some graduate students paint the Feynman diagrams on the van. And so I called uh, Ralph Layton, who was Feynman's former drumming partner, who I knew through Skeptics. And uh, he goes, yeah, yeah, I think it's at this gas station. And so parked in this gas station. So I'm driving around off the 210 freeway and I finally, find, he's like, get off this exit. So I get, and I find the van. There it is. Cause they just parked it there and, you know, weeds are growing up through the wheel wells or whatever. So, uh, so that, then he eventually had it recovered and somebody was storing it in a garage by the time Feynman, uh, by the time Tufty, I was talking to Tufty. So we drove down to this guy's garage and we open it up and pull it out. And then, so, uh, Tufty and I took pictures. So here's Tufty on the bottom and me next to Feynman's van. <laughs> that those are the so Feynman cool. diagrams. Yeah, it's super cool. And Feynman even tells a story, possibly apocryphal, because he was quite the uh, storyteller, was that, you know, he, he lived in Altadena, up above Pasadena, driving down to Caltech at some stoplight, and somebody says, hey, how come you have Feynman diagrams on your van? He said, because I'm Feynman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but if it is, it would be super cool. Like, oh my God, there's the man, right? <laughs> so, there he is. Uh, and, yeah, and, in a and cargo now, van. Yeah. And then now, um, uh, it's now been restored, and it's it's. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if the pieces have been taken off the panels, or if they still have the whole van in a in a storage uh, unit to pr preserve it in perpetuity. I mean, it's an ugly, ugly van, but the diagrams are super cool, <laughs> right? So I actually called Why that. Did, the, so what was the Go ahead. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. This is oh, I'm just your story is way more interesting than it. No, 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 I just so I wrote one of my Scientific American columns. I call it the Feynman Tufty Principle, uh, which is that. So this now quoting Tufty. Um, let's see, what did he write here? Oh yes, uh, Feynman diagrams are the embodiment of what Tufty teaches about analytical design. Quote: Good displays of data help to reveal knowledge relevant to understanding mechanism, process, and dynamics, cause and effect. Visual representations of evidence should be governed by principles of reasoning about quantitative evidence. Clear and precise seeing becomes as one with clear and precise thinking. So he's keeping the two of them together. My favorite example of this that I, I, pull, I used in my book, The Believing Brain, but I pull it directly from Tufti's work, is the problem Galileo had with Saturn. So, you know, Galileo had all these beautiful diagrams of the sun, the moon, craters, all the stuff that challenged uh, pre-Copernican thinking, and uh, including the moons going around Jupiter, which he tracked from night to night and said, well, look, this celestial object has objects going around it. So clearly not everything goes around the Earth, right? And uh, But when he got to Saturn, he had a problem. First of all, Saturn's twice as far away as Jupiter, so it's really hard to make out particularly with these crappy little telescopes he had. And uh, so he, from night to night, it, it's like, it looks kind of fuzzy and oblong, and sometimes I can't quite, you know, so he, he so this is from Tufty here, this diagram here, in which Galileo puts the actual um, illustration in the text himself, which Tufty described as this incredible innovation. Like, you put a visual diagram in the sentence you're writing to fully capture what it is you're talking about. But he's showing these different versions of Saturn because it looks different on given nights or different parts, times of the year and so on. He can't quite make out what's going on. So there was a problem of data. The data was just not very good. And two, there was no theory of planetary rings. So it never occurred to anybody that, well, those are rings. What's a ring? <laughs> no one would even think of it, right? So it wasn't until, and then again, this is from Tufty. Um, Christian Huygens figured it out, what, 55 years later. And so Christian Huygens presents this diagram here of all the different theories about what Saturn was until it was finally figured out, well, they're planetary rings. And then Tufty elevates this particular diagram right here as like the most important, best diagram in the history of science. Because it shows, first of all, it shows the sun at the center, so the Copernican principle rather than the Ptolemaic principle. Then it shows the orbit as an ellipse rather than a circle. So this is Kepler, adopted Kepler. And then it shows Saturn at different times of the year from different perspectives of, of if you're on Earth looking at Saturn and that's what it's going to look like at different times of the year because the rings are going to be tilted. So he, you know, what did he describe this? It's like, uh, it's like a noun and a verb. It's all this action motion in one diagram. And, uh, you know, that just sort of captures this idea of, of the kind of simplicity of a complex idea if you do it right in the visual presentation. 
That's fascinating. Did you get to talk to Tufty at all about his own like intellectual process? I mean, I'm sure some of it's reflected in his books if I go back and look, but I'm just curious of like, how much was he, as he was like making this field of information design, how much was he looking at the, the designs themselves and then distilling the principles out of them versus like going and looking at the psychology and the, yeah, those types of things and then like going to find design examples. I don't know. I don't, I didn't, it's I don't, a great I didn't blend. Really, yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think we had a conversation about that, but just, just this idea of, you know, the kind of sim, uh, what he called simple design, intense content. Now you, you mentioned, I think you mentioned his uh, discussion on PowerPoint and the PowerPoint fluff, yes. the stuff that, I mean, all the crap people put in these slides, that has no purpose whatsoever. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, somebody's staring at a dike. Well, so he has these examples of the Columbia and the um, the, the two space shuttle disasters, um, the Challenger and Columbia, both of which were kind of complicated by the fact that the engineers presenting the data to decision makers was just done so poorly. It wasn't clear what, what the right thing to do. So, uh, you know, Feynman, again, Feynman showing up and, you know, putting that simple O-ring in a glass of ice water and showing that it doesn't bounce back. Therefore, the temperature must have been a problem. That that's Tufty's example of a super simple demonstration. Even though it was it was already pretty clear to the engineers it, it was a temperature problem, but how to convey that to the panel that he's presenting this to the you know the presidential commission to figure out what went wrong, you know that's such a great example of simple you're kind of subtracting away all the crap in these diagrams. Here it is, super simple. I got it. Yeah. That's it. I mean, his <laughs> Tufty's right. The, his piece on PowerPoint is is amazing. If you're listening and you haven't read that, it's uh, well worth the time. But I mean, it's also an example of the you know how adding has become easier and even become the default because a lot of this stuff in PowerPoint is just there, right? It's like this automatically puts in this big chunky bullet point every time you make a new point, and that's. You know, in Tufty's term, it's it's not it's it's ink that's not providing any information. Um, and so he he goes in and talks about all these ways that this kind of tool is automating adding. Uh, that that's my analysis of it. But it's automating the adding, which makes the so now we have to actually subtract to get to the diagrams that um, that are so powerful. Yeah, I have my students do a student TED talk, 18 minutes, and I, I, I give them a whole lesson on how to build a PowerPoint slide right out of Tufty, of course. And, uh, and that reminds mm -hmm. me, the first time I, I spoke at TED in 2006, when it was in Monterey, uh, California, uh, the, the, they send you a list of how to give a TED talk. And it was just a, um, like a, a little thing, that, I forget what you call it, the mouse, a mouse pad. It was a mouse pad. It was just like 10 different things. That's it. And then this, the next, then Ted got big and famous. And then I gave a second Ted talk in 2010 and they sent me just, a, it was a PDF file, but it was like 37 pages long of how to give a Ted talk. I'm like, oh my God, you know, with all the instructions, exactly what to do and stand on the, you know, the red uh, circle mat, uh, rug and do this and the slides. And it's like, this is totally overproduced. And, uh, you know, I think it makes people too nervous. Like, oh my God, I got to remember 37 pages of stuff when I'm up there, make sure I do it right. So that would be an example, I think, of that bureaucratic regulatory growth where, you know, trimming, subtracting a lot of that would, would probably be helpful. Uh, there was a, uh, in the 2010 one, there was a, a MIT physicist or astronomer uh, who was just scheduled to give a talk uh, on whatever research is. Uh, but but the opening day, there had been some discovery about black holes. So Chris Anderson, the owner of TED, says uh, and that, uh, and makes an announcement about this. And I'm going to bring up so-and-so from MIT. And I think it was MIT anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, just tell us what uh, what this is all about. So he did great, just you know, off the cuff. Uh, and But then when it came time to his talk the next day, he gets up and he starts in. And, he, and, and all, he's like maybe five minutes in and then he just freezes. And he's like, Ugh. and then he takes his phone out and then he's got to go through the, put in the code and then he scrolls it. Okay. And then he kind of backs up three sentences and starts back in again. And, and we're like, oh, and then again, like two minutes later, he freezes again. He goes back to the phone and he was so nervous. It was like so overproduced. You could see he was like trying to think of all these things. And so but Chris just finally gets up and says, all right, take a deep breath. We can edit all this. Don't worry about it. Just tell us what it is you do. What's your research? And then it was like, and then he was fine. 
And this is an yeah. example of, you know, uh, too much stuff, just subtract a bunch of that crap and just talk. It sounds like, yeah, the working memory example um, where, you know, there's, we, there's a massive amount of information that we can like store and have access to, but the amount that we can kind of attend to while we're doing something, whether it's, you know, doing surgery, which is an example that I use in the book, or it's giving a TED talk, it's only like, you know, the, the famous paper on it calls it the, the lucky no number seven plus or minus two. It's like these are the number of things that you can keep in your working memory. And who knows what the actual number is, but it's probably less than 10. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's a, a perfect example. You give all this information and you're actually distracting away from what you think are the, the 10 most important things or the, the mouse pad. So that's the, that's the, um, that's the Shermer Ted principle. If the Feynman Tufty <laughs> principle is only the amount of information that can fit on a van, yours is only the amount of information that can fit on a mouse pad. Yeah. So talk about the um, Embarcadero in San Francisco. I, you know, I, I've been there many times. I was there in the seventies, the eighties, nineties. And I, I don't even remember that story happening because oh, really? I don't live there. Yeah, no. And, and uh, now the Embarcadero is just one of the coolest places ever to walk around. At least it was, I don't know if the homeless thing has reached there, but in any case, so that Embarcadero free, I knew nothing about that. It's such a great story. So tell us about that. Yeah, I experienced it like you. I went there and my wife had it number one on our to-do list when we went to San Francisco and I walked around. It's, I mean, it, it was beautiful when I was there, which was four years ago and just this thriving water, eastern waterfront of San Francisco, um, people commuting to, to their jobs on bikes and also just a lot of tourists there enjoying it. You could see the harbor seals. My son got a balloon monkey made for him. Uh, it's just a, a, great, a great public space that was being used by a lot of people. And I remember when I went back home, one of my former PhD students had used this example in some of his projects because we, we talk about infrastructure a lot about how beneficial it was to remove this two lane highway from San Francisco. And I was like, I wonder if that's the same spot. And sure enough, it was that there was this two lane double decker concrete freeway blocking that waterfront from like the 1950s when there was a lot of money for um, for interstate highways. Uh, up until 1990 and um but the story of removal is really interesting the uh you know planning experts wrecking this wasn't an issue of planning experts didn't think of it right they they realized that hey if we took down this freeway this is a pretty pri prime real estate um and but the the public really resisted it um and i think so it probably more kind of falls into the endowment effect loss aversion and also just some very real worries about traffic, right? It's like, yeah, it blocks our waterfront, but if we take away this two lane or this double decker highway, what's that going to do for, you know, the, the merchants who are served by the highway? So planners had long been advocating for it. The, hey, let's get rid of this, make our city a better place. That got put to a public vote once, I think around 1980, and it was like two to one against getting rid of it. And the planners just kind of set it aside. They said, yeah, it's a good idea from our perspective, but clearly there's no public support for it. <laughs> then the earthquake happened in 1989, and this was the, the World Series earthquake. Um, and what happened was um, it, it damaged the freeway enough that now the calculus was, do we want to, you know, pay to reinforce this thing? And, you know, you had this image in your head of the oak. There was a freeway in Oakland where most of the, the deaths happened in the earthquake that the top deck fell onto the, the bottom deck. And, you know, it was basically the same exact design as this Embarcadero freeway. So, so post-earthquake, that kind of shifted enough perspective to get this thing through where they we were going to get rid of the the Embarcadero Freeway. Um, even still, though, when after the earthquake, when they got rid of the Embarcadero Freeway, the mayor, from my understanding of it, like reading through the historical documents, that it was a big issue in the mayoral election. The mayor got voted out of office who got took down the freeway and the planning commission who got rid of the freeway were all out of um, out of their jobs, too. And so there was just this example of even after you think of subtracting, there's a lot of resistance to it. It's not a natural thing. And even, you know, 10 years after it was down, by then people were like, oh, why didn't we, why didn't we do this sooner? But it's an example of how, how hard it is to subtract. Also, this is something that is um, kind of ties into your cultural 
evolution discussion from before, right? It's like, well, before there were highways, this there wasn't this option to subtract a highway to make um, cities better. And if you're following the infrastructure plan, I mean, this is like a central element of the the current infrastructure plan is like, okay, let's at least evaluate these these highways that are bisecting cities and and tell if they're see if they're doing more harm than good, and if they are, then we can we can get rid of them. Yeah, there's like I've been in, lived in Southern California my whole life and you know the freeways just get wider and wider and the traffic just just gets worse and worse. It's like well we I mean if you have growth, I guess just more and more cars are just going to fill up those freeway lanes. I mean the 405 freeway by the by from the 10 up to like the Getty Center, you know, it's like six lanes on each side and you know in any given day, right. most of the hours of the day, it's like 12 lanes of parking lot. It's like, well, where were those cars before it was six lanes, when it was two lanes or three lanes? Well, they were on side streets or they didn't the exist time. or I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, one of the examples. That, have you heard of Braze's Paradox? I mean, so this is in the book. I'll, I'll just tell the story because it's fascinating. It's called Braze's Paradox. He's this mathematician. Oh, and my editor, right. when I kept writing about it, she was she kept coming back and saying, why is this a paradox? Why is this a paradox? And the, the reason it's a paradox it's well is it's so counterintuitive that subtracting could actually make a system better that this thing is considered a paradox so this mathematician found that if you take a piece out of a, a system an underperforming system sometimes the system gets better <laughs> right so it's like this um and the most famous applications of this mathematical proof uh, come from city planning and you know where they find they take out a, a freeway like the Embarcadero freeway for example when they took that out traffic didn't necessarily get get worse um, and what ha the reason for that is is these systems aren't optimized equilibriums in the first place right so people have just found their way to get around San Francisco and it's working well enough for them and they settle into that routine and don't change anything so it's this at this suboptimal equilibrium when you take a piece out, you're basically shaking the whole system up and then it settles into other some some other suboptimal equilibrium. And it could be it could be better uh, and it could be worse. Um, and so Braze's paradox is that, OK, removing a piece of an un underperforming system can improve the performance of the system or make the performance of the system worse. Um, and it's just the it's happened so much that planners now kind of expect it or it's not surprising anymore when it happens with one of these highway removals but it's just a an example of how unthinkable it can be that subtracting would actually make something better and the, the other story that ties into this at the systems level there's this gestalt psychologist kurt kafka are you familiar with him he's a lewin no some he, kafka somebody, or lewin yeah kafka kafka is the one oh, who had kafka. the quote lewin is another one but Kaf, the gestalt psychologists were these psychologists in germany who were Basically, instead of looking at discrete elements of psychology, we're trying to like take a whole systems view. But Kafka was kind of the mouthpiece of the Gestalt psychologist. He's a fascinating guy. He had four, he was married four times to the same two women. <laughs> so, <laughs> however, that works out. Um, but uh, but Kafka, his um, he's the originator of that sports cliche: the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, but that's not as that's not his phrase. His Kafka's phrase was the whole is something else than the sum of its parts. So it's the same as this Braze's paradox that and and Kafka like he would get mad. He he would he would say this is not a principle of addition when people kind of mis uh misattributed his his original quotation because his point was that like the the system it could be the whole could be better than the sum of the parts. The whole could also be worse than the sum of the parts. So it's kind of another example of overlooking subtraction in systems. Yeah, that reminds me of that, you know, that sports cliche, there's no I in team, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. at Kobe's memorial, Shaq told a funny story about where the, 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 some particular game oh. where, where Kobe, Kobe was on fire and he was just not passing and he was just, go, you know, just trying to score every time. And so, Sha you know, the, the guys were complaining. So Shaq says, I'll go talk to him. So he goes over and talk to him and says, you know, Kobe, there's no I in team. And he goes, yeah, but there's an M and an E in there, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and so Shaq says, I went back to the guys and said, he's not passing today. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's a little funny sidebar. That's, a, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so let's talk about uh, three more real uh, uh, issues, climate change and racial BLM anti-racism movement. And uh, so you talk a, a bit about those, you know, what? so climate change, what are we doing, adding, subtracting, uh, you know, in terms of like solving this problem? How do you think about that? Uh, I mean, it, first and foremost, I think that's the same basic recommendation. It's like, here's this massive, uh, you know, if we're talking about our current era as the Anthropocene, right, this means that human activity is the, you know, the, the, act, the, the behavior of one species has become the dominant influence on the entire planet. Um, we need to think of all of our options for behavior as humans, right? So we can add things and we can subtract things. That's, you know, obvious, but I think worth stating. Um, and everything from these like specific, you know, the freeway removals is helpful for climate change, right? That's helping people find alternative modes of transportation. And so there's these practical things that kind of fit into different, you know, climate wedges. They're not going to solve the whole issue by themselves, um, but they're a necessary piece that we're not going to think of if we overlook subtraction. But then even just zooming up to the scale of what the fundamental issue is here, which is too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's really clear that we have to subtract some. Um, and uh, and I think, you know, I think we're considering that adequately now with the geoengineering efforts and, you know, planting trees to get rid of CO2, but also some of the other kind of more uh, uh, more engineered ways of doing it. And I'm not I don't know any of those are right or wrong, but there's certainly, we need to be studying them. Um, but I also think that for a really long time, we didn't real, the options that were on the table, at least from my perspective, were, okay, keep going how we're going or slow the rate at which we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere. And if we delayed for a really long time on thinking seriously about how to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is the, the fundamental problem with climate change. I also think that, you know, to the extent that the, you know, this thinking of progress as growth only, I um, mean, this is more less a kind of the, the physical argument and more like the social argument, but uh, thinking of growth and progress is the same thing is, is harmful. And there's another path between, you know, just adding, which is growth and, you know, kind of staying where we are, which is, you know, another thing that gets advocated by people who care about climate change. And these are the people who are like, well, let's go back to how we behaved 100 years ago. But um, subtracting is kind of a another option there that we're not thinking as much about, in my opinion, which would kind of have the best of both worlds, where these people who want to do something to address climate change, we need to do something. Um, well, subtracting is an option that doesn't like take us over these planetary tipping points and um, and can and allows us to be active in trying to change the situation. So that's that's the climate change um, kind of argument. And I did a I, there's this organization rare that focuses on behavior change for climate. And so if people are interested in learning more about that. I did a whole hour conversation with them on how this ties into climate change. But I, I mean, that's how, you know, that's how I came to the to the research topic was an interest in that issue and seeing this as kind of like a fundamental mindset that could be contributing to some of these planetary problems we have. Yeah, the simple subtraction solution, well, just stop using so much carbon dioxide, stop, stop, stop using fossil fuels. Well, okay, then you know, where are we going to, you first, <laughs> uh, you know, you right. say to, uh, uh, you know, maybe a third, third world developing country says to the United States who says, you know, you shouldn't burn so much fossil fuels. Well, you first, um, you know, we need the energy. So he, to me, the problem is, yeah. seems like this, like the geoengineering problems or, or some of these crazy ideas of like uh, putting up into the atmosphere, these tiny little particles that'll block sunlight or adding solar panels in space that'll block sunlight. I mean, this is adding and adding, you know, what could go mm -hmm. wrong putting more particles in the atmosphere? Uh, <laughs> the, to, to me, this is just crazy. Now, the idea of adding, mm -hmm. let, let's say, um, you know, windmills and solar panels and, and and other things to replace fossil fuels. First of all, I'm, I'm not, it's not clear to me that this could actually replace, produce the amount of energy we need and are going to need. What I see, it doesn't seem like it without nuclear. If you add nuclear, then I, I think we could do it. But there's other issues with nuclear. People are, you know, afraid of things they can't see or smell or taste or touch. Or, you know, it's like, what is it? It's this visible poison. And then you then you hear the words, you know, Three Mile Island and, and, or, and uh, or Chernobyl. And 
and uh, Fukushima, um, you know, and 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 the China syndrome. You know, that movie came out the same week that that uh, that that th you know three three mile happened. Anyway, so um, all that to me complicates it. And it's not all clear. Add, subtract. It's going to be a complex formula. Uh, again, we didn't you know, it didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. We just found better ways to produce the stuff we need. So to me, just better technology going forward that's more efficient maybe is the solution to subtract the amount of fossil fuels we're using. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, certainly efficiency needs to be a huge part of it. And this is not a, you know, I'm just to be clear, like I'm not solving climate change here, uh, but I like offering my little small contribution to some thinking that might help a lot of smart people and a lot of collective action help. So I, I we need to be doing all of these things. I mean, this is a really big problem. There's a great book, uh, David Mackay, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. I'm pretty sure you can get it for free on the internet. But he, like you just said, Michael, he he breaks down like none of these. Solar's not a magic solution. Wind's not a magic solution. We need to be doing all of these things. And included in the, all of these things is like sucking some CO2 out of the atmosphere at this point by, you know, the least intrusive means possible i guess yeah then uh, you also talked about racism you you mentioned uh ibram x Kendi's book anti-racism and you know this is a popular topic now because it's important and after the george floyd murder clearly there's you know we're not to a post-racial society yet how do you think about that in your model hey uh Again, this is not like me solving these problems, but I, I think one yeah, of the things that's interesting about, yeah, about, well, I know you understand it, to make clear, <laughs> uh, but Ke Kendi's, um, I, how to be an anti-racist, I mean, that thing, that is kind of a subtractive recommendation, right? He's saying in this complex system, you have to identify the thing that is problematic and the problematic thing is the systemic racism. And then you have to identify it and then remove it persistently identify it and remove it and so i don't know i think um uh to take it from a really grand level down to a really explicit example like when we're talking about this in our department for example i mean our department i think everybody that i know cares immensely about this but we're also a engineering department at a school in a traditionally conservative state and so it's like a lot of white men sitting there talking about this and you know, we we talk a lot about adding diversity, right? It's like, how do we get, you know, convince the these young black scholars to come join us? Um, but what about subtracting racism, right? <laughs> and so, like, this is, and how much good that would do. So we, we had uh, in our department, like, after the George Floyd thing, we had a lot of, you know, like, well-intentioned dialogue. I think some people saying stuff they wish they didn't say, but it was, you know, I think coming from a, place of trying to make the situation better. But then we had some people who were like taking people's names from the listserv um, anonymously and then like sending them to porn subscription sites. And it's like, okay, well, what? like that's the stuff that, yeah, we can, we can get rid of. I don't, yeah, apparently this is something that people do. Um, and so anyway, that I think like focusing on the, the actual systemic racism and paying as much attention to, to getting rid of that as we do to just like adding diversity, even like a, a search committee, right? And adding and subtracting. So in engineering, we've got, you know, you have a search committee to hire faculty members and these are people who are gonna be at the university for the next 30 years. And in well-intentioned efforts to have more diversity, we'll say, okay, well, let's, we gotta make sure that the black person, the black faculty member is on this search committee. And that leads to this unintended consequence of the faculty members of color are on all these things that aren't actually helping them progress their careers, but are important for the for the university. But what about like removing some of the redundant white males from the search committee, right? So if you got a, instead of a search committee of five with two people from underrepresented groups, could you have a search committee of three? Get rid of two of the people from overrepresented groups and just have the people from underrepresented groups. So. Those are some examples of how, like, we're not necessarily thinking of subtracting. I think, you know, again, from the grandest scale at this, you know, the fundamental problem here is systemic racism. How do we identify it and then get rid of it down to some mundane examples? And it, it all goes back to that, 
this is a problem that we're trying to change, right? This is a situation we're trying to take from how it is to how we want it to be, just like the Lego bridge. We want to have all our options uh, as we think about it. I guess it wouldn't be practical hiring faculty or any corporation hiring somebody to do what the uh, you know orchestras did, you know, blind uh, auditions where the person's behind a curtain, all you do, you just hear them yeah. playing. Maybe that's too simple an example that couldn't be applied in, in corporations and universities. Yeah, that's interesting. That um, part of the problem. I mean, so the orchestra example is like, yeah, you just don't know who this person is, and um, I. I like to think we're past the bias once they're at this, but there's a huge like pipeline problem too, right? It's yeah, like the, yeah, the supply yeah. of, um, yeah, the, the number of underrepresented people who are getting doctorates is low. The number who are starting the programs is low. Um, but so I think that could be part of the solution, but it's certainly not gonna fix all of it probably, unfortunately. Yeah, the pipeline problem in STEM this it gets back to a Jamie Demore's famous memo to Google that got him fired. Uh, well, you know, was well, why aren't there more women in STEM? And uh, so, as, as I understand it, I've, I haven't read his memo in a long time, but it was mostly about career interest choices rather than cognitive abilities. I mean, we know women and men are uh, perfectly the same average on IQ scores, and women are capable of doing pretty much anything men are. There's slight differences between genders and different specific tasks, but uh, I don't think anyone would argue, well, women are just not capable of doing math or, or, or any of the STEM stuff, certainly not. But what Jamie was talking about was, you know, the kind of career choices you're interested in making happens way earlier in life, like, you know, grammar school and middle school or whatever. And that when you give uh, kids these vocational interest uh, tests, like in eighth grade or whatever, you know, the, the females are more likely to gravitate toward people oriented careers, males, more stuff, things oriented careers. This is the argument. And that by the time they get to college and graduate school, they've already gone down one path or the other. So, for example, now there's now that the barriers have been removed, there's more women medical doctors uh, uh, getting MDs now. And, and same thing with PhDs, I think, in uh, well, certainly the social sciences, it's like 70-30 now, in psychology and sociology, anthropology, and so on. And I think uh, in the biological sciences, it's now even slightly more females than males getting PhDs. Um, so so once we've removed the uh, prejudices and biases against women, uh, then the differences are probably going to be explained by just vocational interest, you know, just what you're interested in doing. And uh, so, something like that is is how, how I think I think about the pipeline problem. And so you may be trying to solve a problem that's not directly solvable by your hiring practices. It's it's a so society wide issue that has other issues. Or or you know, in the case of Kendi, you know, his definition of racism is any graph you show where there is any differences between blacks and whites on anything. Home ownership rates, you know, uh, a- average a- annual income, uh, how many CEOs or congressmen, and, and on and on. It's all to him uh, explained by, you know, you know, racism. Well, you know, social scientists would say no, that, that we can't make that conclusion just automatically. It might be there might be hiring practices in which it's still all white guys that they don't want to hire African Americans. That could be. But if that's the case, then tell us who they are. Who's doing this? Because that would actually be illegal. It's already illegal. There's laws against that. You know, so uh, it's, my problem with all of that is that this idea of systemic racism, well, okay, what can we do about it? It's too big. It's too big a problem. You know, I just, like the example I use is the Starbucks manager, you know, that called the police on those two African Americans that were loitering in the Starbucks, right? So, Starbucks shuts down for an entire day. They sent all 750,000 employees to a sensitivity training program. 99% of them are totally liberal, inclusive, not prejudiced, and so on. Too big a, too, a specific problem does not need a, a grand solution. Anyway, that, that was my point. Yeah, no, I think a couple of things there. I mean, first of all, it's not my area of expertise, obviously, but the um, I do think, yeah, and, and any... Thing that's called systemic racism, I think we shouldn't just jump to conclusions that it is in fact systemic racism without evidence that the, the racist part is systemic, right? But I do think, I mean, I do now notice things that are systemically racist in 
my narrow neck of the woods. Um, I mean, just the, the fact not having, um, not having black mentors for a black student, um, you know, not seeing as many black faculty, not seeing it or, you know, systemic sexism, not seeing as many women faculty. Those are things that it's like, to me, it's pretty clear that it's systemic and it's, um, anyway, so, so, but yeah, I agree that every and everything can't just be chalked up to this grand notion of systemic racism. Otherwise you can't fix it. But if you, if you identify the systemic thing as, oh, well, we've, you know, relied on these tests that are systemically biased towards one racial group, then that can actually be fixed. Um, but then back to your thing about engineering, I agree completely in the, in the pipeline in science, right? And engineering, we'll talk a lot about this. It's like, oh, we just got to get the message out there about engineering. And I've done some research too. We, this was like through sustainability where one thing that we found is that um, women and minorities and some underrepresented groups tend to be more interested in sustainability themed topics in engineering. And the reason is because they tie into those human dimensions, right? How ridiculous is it that people don't view engineering as helping people, <laughs> right? And that's like a failure to, to communicate on our part as the engineering field about like what what it is that we do because everything we do is fundamentally to help people um but we just because oh, we yes. focus so much on the science science and the math right and you know these kind of exactly right answers and leave the people out of it we we aren't um we aren't necessarily bringing in these people who want to help people <laughs> which is a big missed yeah, opportunity yeah. for us I guess it yeah. depends on what that, yeah, what the actual day-to-day -day job is, what you enjoy doing. Uh, you well, know, it's hard the to see the benefits. Yeah, the benefits to people of good bridges. Of course, it's there, but it's that's far down the line, and maybe just in terms of what you do from eight to five. Um, but again, you know, Sally Ride had this program back in the '90s about helping girls get uh, getting more girls into STEM, and she pointed out that girls tend to drop out of those kinds of classes around eighth grade. And uh, so her interpretation was, is that, you know, the instructors are just not encouraging them or their parents or society at large. So that would address you know, some of the stuff you're talking about. But again, a social scientist may say, well, that's one hypothesis. There could be other explanations for it. And so again, if, if, there, if there is somebody, like if, if your department doesn't have the representative number of African-Americans, you know, should we just automatically include you and your colleagues or a bunch of racists or you have some unconscious bias? I would say probably not. I mean, we know that, you know, universities and colleges are among the most liberal, inclusive. You know, the desire for diversity is there, absolutely. And, uh, you know, so now there's actually a, a, a major. You can major in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Get a degree in, because everybody is scrambling to hire uh, deans and, and uh, vice presidents of diversity, inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion (DEI) it's actually a major now, and uh, you know so. But 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 what are they doing? They're you know they're they're on these campuses that are already amongst the most liberal, inclusive, <laughs> desire for equity places anywhere on earth ever in history, right? So I, I, I can't help but feeling like we're adding uh, uh, rather than subtracting. Now I'm I, I have to say I'm in a very minority position here that in terms of just stop talking about race. Just stop it. Stop cataloging everybody by the box that they're in based on how much melanin they have in their skin. It's irrelevant. It's the last thing I, I'm interested in. I shouldn't be interested in your race. It, it's it's uninteresting, unimportant. I don't care. You shouldn't care. We should stop talking about it. Now, people think I've lost my mind when I say this because we're moving in the opposite direction. But, you know, this is, again, my concern about Kendi is, you know, he, this, he wants to, you know, make this a central point of our national conversation. Let's talk about race. Well, to me, it, you know, Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, you know, that people would be judged by the content of the character, not the color of their skin. Now we're talking about the color of people's skin. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we have to do this for a while longer before we can subtract that as a, as a point of conversation. Just stop talking about it so that I don't have to even think about it. I don't want to know what your skin color is. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I mean, for me, the systemic, the thing that's been helpful with the systemic part is that you can tease out the distinction, tease out a distinction between, hey, me and my colleagues aren't racist, but we're part of a 
racist system that we've either inherited or that we've like contributed to un, uh, unwittingly. And that by, by analyzing the system itself, um, again, back to your point about like, nobody's arg no, there's no argument about, Hey, let's try to make this better. It's just like, what's the way to make this better. And by analyzing the system itself, that's another way to, to try to make this better. And I think, um, for me, like where the rubber meets the road, that's the difference between like, Oh, how do we just, you know, kind of make sure that we hire the next applicant who happens to be from a minority group to our department versus how do we, you know, change our hiring practices so that we get more applicants or so that change our training practices so that we're producing more good applicants for other schools. So anyway, I don't know how that all ties into the, the theories that different people are, are putting out there about how to make this better. But I do think that the, that that's where the, that distinction of systemic racism has been helpful for me. Um, yeah, I, I understand. So let's assume that none of you in your department of engineering are racist. But your point is that, and in fact, you're probably going out of your way to find, uh, diversify your faculty. Um, uh, but the problem is the pipeline problem. There's just not as many options and anybody coming up available for a job probably has many offers. So unless you make it, your offer really generous, he's probably gonna, he or she's probably going to get pulled away to Harvard or some other place that has more money to offer can make a better offer all the way around something like that that that's probably the long and maybe that just takes generations maybe that's a 50-year problem to solve or a hundred year problem or something like that anyway it's uh same the same thing with women in stem and, and, and how many google programmers computer programmers there are it's not 50 50 gender wise and i don't know if it ever will be is that an indication that there's a problem or is that just something else uh I, yeah, anyway it's it's a hard one to solve. It's hard, yeah. Uh, um, but I do think that there's, uh, we need to be able to talk about it, that's for sure. So I'm glad that there's room for people to say what they think is the best way to solve it and have healthy debate about it. I think there it. is. I, I don't know if there, some, some things you, you can get. No, you're right. It's it su subject to cancel culture for say, I just say what I want because I'm pretty independent. I can't be fired, really. So, but, you know, I, I, I do feel you know, concerned about people that want to speak out or want to, you know, offer other options and they're afraid to say anything for, for good reason. Um, but anyway, that's... Yeah, and also being able to to say something and then just say, oh, now that I've learned more, I don't think that anymore, <laughs> right? And that being an okay thing, right? Uh, so even if you say something that is wrong or like that you, ten, you know, 10 days later think is wrong or that you, I don't know, I just... Yeah, the punishment for saying seems to be pretty heavy sometimes when. Uh... Another example of this I thought of, since you have a young son who's probably going to go off to school soon. I don't know if you said I'm going to send him to public school or private school. But uh, so I had Chris Edwards on, who's a education reformer and a AP history teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we got to talking about what he calls, uh, I think he called it the zip code problem of public education that. The, the the best predictor of housing prices in a, in most communities is who has the best schools. So this school has a, a reputation of being better. So more and more parents want to live in that zip code, so they can send their kid to that public school, and that drives the housing prices up. So that community gets a little more money from the pr property tax. So then the school gets better, and you get this runaway feedback effect. And then the poorer schools, they, they get ever worse. So it's the Matthew effect. To those who have more shall be given. Those who don't have, they'll get even less. And you get this kind of uh, divisiveness. Now, that would be an example, I think, of a kind of a systemic problem. Nobody's racist. Nobody's, you know, anti-poor or whatever. We're just all scrambling to send our kids to the best schools because that's what we want for our kids. And that kind of pushes people, it pushes the system into this kind of binary system of really good elite schools and really crappy poor schools. And, uh, you know, the solution to that, I don't know, it's probably school choice or vouchers or, you know, more money for public schools. I don't know about that. But, um, but, but that would be like, again, one of these massive problems that, uh, you know, would take probably decades or longer to solve. Yeah, I agree. But I think that's where, I mean, that's a perfect example of the, the, Analyzing the systemic element of it helps you get closer to what the actual problem is. 
right? And so like by knowing that, you know, hey, this is tied into real estate values and how property taxes get distributed to schools, then you can be like, oh, well, maybe we should distribute property taxes evenly across the city or something like that. Um, but uh, anyway, that's, but yeah, that's, and you asked about my son, he's three when we were doing the Legos and he's six now and he didn't go to school for the first year. Well, we had, we were fortunate enough to be able to send him to private school because of the pandemic. And, but yeah, next year he enters first grade and um that'll it does change your perspective on these things when it's your kid <laughs> <laughs> totally of course and that's how everybody yeah. you know everybody thinks like that right yeah so exactly. yeah <laughs> all right laddie we've been going let's see oh almost two hours we're, we're approaching joe rogan length here of a podcast as i like to joke uh nice. so we'll, we'll, well keep, i'm learning we'll a lot <laughs> We'll keep it under. We'll keep it under two hours. So, all right. Give us the uh, kind of bring us uh, to the finish line here. Uh, what's the what's the kind of take home message? And, and, uh, and, and actually, let's do this. Let's give us a little PSA for like how people can improve their lives by simplifying things. Like, should I throw out these shirts hanging in my closet I haven't worn in ten years? I look at them and go, Oh, I really like that shirt. I might wear it again, but I never do. So, just stuff like that. Well, there's experts out there who can tell you how to subtract in all these ways. And I think that those experts are some of the best evidence of the of the main problem here is that like left to our devices, we're systematically overlooking subtraction. So I think the, the new thing that I can offer is just this reminder, hey, think about subtraction as a way to, to make your life better. Um, and whether it's your clothes, whether it's your calendar, or whether it's the ideas that are in your head with something we didn't touch on a ton, but a lot of the scientific revolutions you talked about and the personal thinking revolutions you talked about have come from getting rid of old stuff as much as they do for uh, adding new stuff. So think about how you can subtract across ideas, objects, and situations. And um, you're smarter than I am in, in, those <laughs> situ in, those, in those contexts for your lives. I'm, t I'm meaning you, the listener, right? So I can't prescribe to you what the best thing to subtract is, but if you think about it in those th ways, I think you'll, you'll be better off. I would imagine corporations would love this kind of information. You know, how can we just affect our bottom line since payroll is, you know, the biggest expense companies have. How can I, we keep doing what we're doing with fewer employees? Yeah. I, the, the most practical, the, like another takeaway here, right? I said, okay, now remind yourself to do this, but now that you're listening to this podcast and while it's fresh on your mind, can you go in and give yourself, you know, effectively these reminders that work so well in our experiments? Can you put cues in place in your daily lives, whether it's it's your job or whether it's your, you know, personal to do list or whether it's your editing podcast? Can you go through and put in place reminders that when you come to this decision, this reminder is going to be there that hey, subtracting is an option here. And that's something you could do right away. And that's what seems to help the corporations that I talk to. Sounds good. Well, thanks, Lydie, for coming on the show. Thanks for your book. What's next on your research writing agenda? Well, I mean, I'm still plugging along with the research with graduate students. Um, I'm really interested in this intersection of behavioral science and engineering and these core decisions about sustainability. Um, I, as far as the book, I definitely have plans to, I love you know, communicating outside of the, the regular academic channels. Um, but I am, this is my first book where I've really been able to do that sustainability through soccer. I didn't get to come on your podcast, but, um, <laughs> the, this, <laughs> so I'm really trying to like learn as much as I can from this process. And it, it's helping me think about what my, what my next steps will be. I know what you need to do is a workbook. Like for, for, you know, like how to yeah. simplify your life or for companies, you know, here's a chapter for companies and, and that, like, like write down the hundred things that are in your house that you can immediately look around and then subtract 25 of them. You have to do that by the end yeah. of the day in the dumpster. Yeah. <laughs> People would love that. Um, I want to do like a kid's book uh, so that like you, you, you know, effectively like all these puzzles converted to the kid's level and then. See if we can you know, wean this out of people at the at a very young age but a workbook <laughs> would be popular too you're right <laughs> yeah totally oh another thing i do though uh instead of the dumpster since i said dumpster actually i feel better about getting rid of stuff when i take it to goodwill because i feel like i'm not really throwing oh, it away true. it's it's going to a 
somebody who needs it, whatever. And I, I feel better about that. I had to, I got rid of like a thousand books uh, the last time I moved because I just had just so many. My garage is stacked with books and and uh, I didn't want to give them up. But then I thought, well, but if they go to a library, you know, so I gave them to this library and, and then I felt like, well, that's, you know, then I can let it go. I'm going to, I've tried that logic with my six-year-old, the, the Lego <laughs> aficionado oh, no, and just, with his Lego sets, it, he's not buying it. He doesn't care. No, I know. The, no, no. It's going to Goodwill. <laughs> No, <laughs> the very no, mature no. perspective I, you have. I, I, I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure that the, the floor of my son's bedroom looks like yours. I mean, it's just trucks and cars and Legos, and uh, he can barely walk in there. <laughs> Wait, we maybe we should get rid of some of this. He looks at me like, "Have you lost your mind? <laughs> we want to add more. Yeah, Let's go to Target." He tries to talk me into going to Target all the time because they have his favorite toys there. Anyway, it's crazy. <laughs> all right, lady, thanks a lot.